you're with Carly on Point Blank TV. Point Blank is a global music school with courses in London, LA, online, and we've very recently launched in Ibiza. Just head to our website, pointblankmusicschool.com, where you can find out more about our courses. And today we're very excited to be joined by a superstar DJ, Mark Fanciulli. How are you going? Yeah, good, thank you. Cool, thank you so much for coming in. That's great to be here. Nice, so you've been shopping before? Yeah, right. like I yeah. thought I'd take advantage of coming into London. Obviously, there's some great shops in the city and yeah, did some record shopping. Nice. Yeah. Got any bangers? Yeah, like yeah. I've, I've got quite a few from Love Vinyl around the corner. Cool. Totally recommend going there if you're in the area. Got some stuff on Network, the old UK techno label. Yeah. So yeah, some stuff I'm going to share on Wax Wednesday soon as well. You can always check that out on my socials. Cool, nice. So today we're going to be um, chatting through a track of yours which is coming out soon on Motec Records, is that right? Yes, yes. Yeah, nice, right. okay, cool. Um, so, I mean, before we kind of crack on with the project, it'd be good to kind of know just a little bit more about you. So you're, you're Nick's younger brother? Yes. Nick Fanchilli's younger brother? Yeah. Cool. So, I mean, that's quite, that's quite interesting having two, you know, brothers that are successful <laughs> DJs. I mean, Mr. and Mrs. Fanchilli have obviously passed on some pretty serious musical genes. They, um, you know, from a young age, we always had, like, everyone who had music playing in the house, and I remember my brother, he, he started uh, with his turntables in his room, you know, really getting into music, and that developed, and he became more and more successful, and when I was a teenager, I started to get into it. He was, you know, like any great brother, he's, he's always been very supportive of it, Yeah. and so I remember sharing his turntables and then buying more records, luckily, I got the back end of when it was mainly vinyl. You know, I was this is about 2000. I was 14, buying records every weekend just before it moved over to digital. Um, but obviously, still buying vinyl now. And yeah, it's just uh, something that developed from there. I, you know, we're very lucky as well because our parents are incredibly supportive. And you know, it's just it was like a there was a lot they passed down to us. You know, with like just having a love to listening to music. Like my dad took his reel to reel player out of the garage a few weeks ago and still works and we've got cassettes on there from 40 years ago. Oh, so amazing. It's amazing that I'm listening to stuff he's got in there, like really trendy stuff, right? And I'm just really amazed by it. Like, yeah. it's just, and especially the quality. So it's just, uh, yeah, it's nice to have. So what, what did you guys grow up listening to? Um, in the house, you'd have, like my dad, especially like listening to disco or rock, mm -hmm. stuff like that. Um, like my dad, for example, who, and, and my mum as well, they're into more housey stuff, especially old turn of the century, like Sandy Rivera, Roger Sanchez stuff and are they like actually old school ravers? They enjoy a party, yeah. <laughs> they enjoy a party, yeah. So I mean, it'd be great to hear like a little bit more about your journey as a DJ and then how that led into production. Yeah. So um, um, you started out on vinyl. Yeah. Well, I was fourteen. Uh, my musical taste at the time was breakbeat, and uh, I've always been a fan of more four four stuff like house and techno. Mm. But it was actually my brother, you know, just playing me for his old records, and I was listening to. The more proggy breaks that you'd have, like you could, that you could imagine Sasha or Zabila playing, yeah. stuff like that. And I was re really listening to it and I thought, I'm going to stick with this. I really like it. And it's always one of those genres that bubbled under. It was, you know, it was about to break through, but, I, you know, it's, I don't think it always has. But when, it, when I got to the age of 18, when I moved away to go to college, I was still buying, at well, that stage, downloading a lot of um, breakbeat. But it felt like... I wasn't enjoying any of the new stuff coming out. Mm -hmm. it, it was very trancey, not as anything wrong with that genre, but it just wasn't my cup of tea. I didn't enjoy anything, you know, and when I was playing, my sets weren't changing, and which is a bad thing. You can't yeah. keep playing the same stuff, you've got to keep it fresh. So I just moved over to doing completely 4 4 house and techno. Okay. And my style and my taste are, like many people, very broad. I, a lot of people might just say, oh, I'll just play techno, I'll play house, but me, yeah. I play across the board. One night you might hear me playing more techno if I'm playing at 5am, yeah. but then I might be playing at 2am and I might be playing more housey or tech house. So yeah. I like to keep it that way. It makes it interesting, fresh, exciting, and you can play in more venues. It's, yeah. there's, pigeonholing restrains you, it restricts you. Yeah. And so what about your kind of, how did you then move into production and how did you, um, did you start on Ableton or? Um, Ableton, I started that early on. Yeah, I remember, I remember when I was about 15, 16 years old, I remember using, I can't remember what it was, it was like a very entry level piece of software. When I was 17, 18, I first got a copy of Ableton, Ableton 4 it was, and I remember that was, that was even before you could put MP3s on it. That was like back then, and I remember when 5 came out, everyone was excited because you could put a 320 on it, like yeah. it, was, it was incredible. But 
I was using that. I partly taught myself, but I had friends around me just um, show me a few tips here and there. And obviously back then there wasn't as many videos on the internet as there are now. So you were kind of left to your own devices to try and yeah. exploit what you could out of it. But then um, I, at the age of 18, when I was really getting you know, into it, I went to college and I did a degree in creative music production. And we started looking at other bits of software. We looked at like, Pro Tools. Mm -hmm. um, I don't really use Pro Tools as much. Like I've well, I do. I have done recently, but in a friend's studio. But um, but I've started to use Logic a lot more. Okay. Until recently, I like the last few years, I've just stayed solely on Ableton. Okay. I was using Logic. I was using Ableton, and I was using them both from Rewire. It was great. You know, I just you, you know, I'm not afraid to try something else if I think it'll benefit my productions. But Ableton, I just feel 100% comfortable with it. You know, yeah. I, I will always look to see if something else can change the sound or improve it. But it's one that's always been there. It's yeah. always it's stayed throughout. It's, it's good for getting ideas down quickly oh, as well, isn't it? Oh, it's it? great. It's great for ideas. It's with my creativity. I'm more creative on the road than I am in a room somewhere. You know, it's unless it's obviously a hotel room, but like at home, I've got a nice setup at home where I create a lot. But I get just as much done on an airplane. Yeah. Like you know, like when I did a track on Planet E a few years ago, I called one of the tracks Helsinki because I wrote it on the flight back from Helsinki and. It's just stuff like that, and then obviously I do all the engineering, it changing all the programming stuff when I get home. Yeah. But it's just, it's like you say, it's easy to use. You can just throw stuff in there. Yeah. It's, um, you know, you people can play live with it and stuff like that. And it's, yeah, it's, it's got a lot of uses. Do you? What's your home studio set up? Like? Um, I've got in my setup. I've, I'm using um, an iMac with mm -hmm. Ableton on it. I'm also using a pair of Dynaudio passive speakers. I've got them. Amplified with a crown amp, um, but they're great. The BM15s, they've, they do a really good sound. And there's also an, a sub which I haven't connected to it. That that is amazing as well if you position it right. Yeah. I like to keep it as simple as possible. But I've got some rack mount gear, like um, you've got here like the Roland's, mm -hmm. some effect strips, and um, a Yamaha DX7. Oh yeah, we were talking about that before. Yeah. But um, the pl plugin wise, I'm I'm using stuff in the Archeria, like the Jupiter. I use a lot, yeah. Um, especially for like the pads and the strings. It's especially when I try to do the Detroit more techno stuff, yeah. And even some house, you know, it's got that, those retro elements within it. And so you have um, a radio show and a record label called yeah. Between Two Points. Yeah. Can you tell us a little bit more about that? Like how, what the inspiration behind it was? Yeah. Um, is it just? Do you just release your own music? Yeah, just my. It's just my own output. The okay. I, I launched the whole. Um, the whole thing last May and it's yeah like basically a monthly radio show where I'll be playing records that are doing it for me at the moment I'll do a mix uh, maybe throwing some old records in there do they do they all fall uh, fall under the kind of house and techno thing yeah. Is it bit, yeah yeah but and sometimes we go a bit further like yeah. I do a feature like old school track of the month like I'm a real fan of rave music in the early 90s like yeah. I play a hardcore record or a drum and bass records and then I'll, I'll get someone to do a guest mix mm -hmm. and also a label of the month feature. So we try to keep it very, and, but primarily a reflection of what I do. Planning on signing any art, other artists? Nothing or? for the moment, okay. nothing for the moment. Um, the only other artist involvement of, is when I do parties. I've only done one at the moment. Uh, we did a, a launch party last year, but that's the only other involvement I'm doing at the moment with outside artists. Maybe something in the future, but mm -hmm. I like to limit it. Three, four releases a year, just my own stuff. Um, a bit more experimental stuff that other labels might not pick up on as well. Yeah. So it's just um, an output solely for me. Cool. So the track today, Deviation. Should we? Um, yeah, yeah sure. So you've got it open there. Um, this is like it's pretty kind of raw, stripped back. Would you say it's yeah. house? Would you say it's techno? I, I'd say it's techno. But yeah, yeah. It's, it's very raw. It's very stripped back. It's, um, it's coming out on DJ 3000's label, um, Motec, mm -hmm. in June. And this is actually the B-side to the, to the record. The, um, what I wanted to get with the, the approach when I started to make the records, I wanted to have something very raw, very stripped back mm -hmm. and very energetic. Was it inspired by another track or a moment um, or a feeling? It, or? Was, that, it was more and more feeling. That's what I wanted to get. Yeah. Like that, that's where this one in particular came. It's when I go into the studio, I might a lot of the time I have an idea of what I want to do, like I do with this. But sometimes it could just be, let's just see where we get. You know, yeah. let's just see what we do. Let's just see where it goes. It could start off one way and it could end up another way. But with this, I it felt you like, had a clear yeah. direction in yeah. mind. Yeah, yeah, there okay. was a clear direction. How did you start this track? Was it the drums? Did you program yeah. the drums? What I did when I first started the record, thinking back, I had the kick, and here for the kick, I've used an audio sample actually. Mm -hmm. 
Where do you get your drum samples from? Uh, drum samples, I've got um, a library full of them, but some of them I get off Loot Masters. They, they've got some great packs on there, yeah. especially I'll go into that later with the, um, the synth as well for the key. So I started with the kick, maybe some of the other percussion elements, but the bass line as well. I wanted something very pounding. It's, as you can see, it's 127 BPM, so there's a lot of pace on it already. Mm -hmm. But I um, used one of the Waves compressors, ran it through that, and, and we can hear the difference that it's already making. Mm -hmm. A lot weaker Massive about it. Difference. Yeah, just by running it through there. Obviously, I've got a limiter just to keep it under control. Yeah. But I did have an EQ plug in here, but you can see it's switched off. This is a wave, Waves plug in. The Wave stuff is great. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of great stuff. So, you got your kick drum. Yeah. What came next? A few more of the um, percussion elements. Mm -hmm. But before, before, after building the percussion elements, you've got the claps here. Mm -hmm. I've given them some space here using this great plug in here, super tap. This almost gives some ambience to it, you'll hear. Because when you're listening to the clapping sound, obviously it sounds a lot weaker. Yeah. You don't want to go too crazy with the processing, but it just opens it up. Mm -hmm. It sounds a lot more, it sits in the mix far better. And Q6 plug-in. I've done a roll off there. I've cut off the roughly almost 400 hertz because this is a very bass heavy record. I didn't want the bottom end to be fine. Yeah, there's the loads of bass yeah. in that kick drum, yeah. isn't there? Yeah, like you can already hear, and obviously we'll add some more in a sec with the um, bass line, which is a tom drum, mm -hmm. effectively. So, Oh, is that how you made it? Yeah, yeah oh, I'll show you how okay. we did that. Yeah, it's, um, but that's why I've had the cut off there and utilities just to give it a boost and yeah. limiters control it. You'll hear now a lot more bass comes in. It's sometimes quite difficult to program drums to have that swing and that groove. Do you have any kind of like tips or tricks? Um, one thing I, I could, in the past, I could be very regimented. I'd want to, you know, effectively snap all the MIDI here, yeah. dead on, one, 1. 1.2, you know, have it dead on. Yeah. If you move it around, even, it a little yeah, bit. even just doing like a manual bit of delay, yeah. it, can make a, it can make a difference, especially yeah. on like hats, it just, it gives it a swing. Mm -hmm. Like, um, obviously you can do it other ways, but I'm becoming less regimented doing it. With um, the Tom bass, what I've done is I've actually sampled a Tom here, and what I've done, is I've got a compressor here. This is some just general housekeeping that will be coming. I've got a side chain channel at the top here. It's mm -hmm. basically just like the kick. It's just, obviously you can't hear it, but you can hear what it's doing. Yeah. Obviously here with the gain reduction, just to give it some space. Very simple stuff, but it makes it. So are you processing this as you go, or is this generally um, done I don't, at the with them, um, I actually, I can, I actually do quite a lot of um, like processing like this during the production, like yeah. uh, obviously as long as I'm happy with the sound and I think it's going to stay there, I'll start to mess about a bit, yeah. you know, like, um, but yeah, a lot of it, because sometimes when I do mix downs at the very end, well, this is the mix down file, obviously it's a bit tidier, mm -hmm. I will, I have, it doesn't take as long, I'll take my time with it, but because yeah. along the way I've, I have um, done the EQs, I've done the, you know, the compression and whatever else is needed and what, yeah what you really need to make have that finished article i might give it one or two days in between just to make sure give it the car test listen to it when i'm out running just to see the difference you know and maybe make a tweak but yeah it's uh i do it as i go along yeah really okay, cool. the base obviously is a, a lot more complex here i've taken a lot of the obviously with the tom the trom drum it had a lot of top end on it i've rolled it down mm -hmm. i found a sweet spot here When you think of a tom drum, you think, oh, that's percussion. You know, if you listen to some of the old acid house records, they use a lot of tom drums in a different way, obviously, very basic off the rolling drum machine to make a bass line, and it sounds great. Yeah. And it's, it's almost the same type of thing. You know, you're using a tom drum, but this is a different type of music. This is this is really like deeper techno, mm -hmm. but you can still use it with it. And one thing I've also done, I've added a bit of reverb on it as well, because it just, it, it gives it a lot more space. Yeah. You'd think 
you know, reverb on a bass instrument, that shouldn't really be done, but yeah. it, it works. I use other drum programs, the dr D60 drummers on this thing, worth looking at as well. It's basically um, like a, a replica of the 909, they do an 808 replica as well. Yeah. Um, it's, it's, it's worth looking at, but this I like, because it's quite easy to program. Would you say most of your tracks you use either the 909 or 808 uh, sample? 909. Every track? I use some samples from the 909. Recently I've been using a lot of 707 as well. Okay. Yeah. Pushing the boat out. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but using them and uh, or a mixture of the both. But yeah, it, it, they can, uh, especially the snare on the 707, I'm really, <laughs> I'm probably overusing it at the moment, but yeah. that, that can be, that's a great sound as well. So you've got the little rim shot thing yeah. going on here. Rim shot there. It just works on here. Triggered it here. I've done the same with the EQ in because it had a lot. I won't hear it as much, but just to give it a bit more space. Very subtle, but that just takes off some of the bottom end mm -hmm. away from the kick and the bass, but it doesn't lose its character. Yeah. You know, it's nothing drastic. Any reverb or anything on it? Yeah, like a tiny bit of reverb here. I've just got going on a send, and we're using the Waves Arbor. Now, this, this plugin itself is you only have to have like 1% for it to really make a difference. And yeah. as you can see, there's only a little bit on the send. Like it's come up very low. But yeah, that's one you've got to approach with caution on the, on the default settings. <laughs> we've got an open hat as well. So we've gone through that. Yeah. I've added a reverb on the actual strip itself. Mm -hmm. That is uh, Ableton one as well. So they even their stock plugins are worth using. Cool. So then you've got a little kind of break coming up. Yep, got a break coming here. And as you can see, I've got the synth coming in. Yep. And you'll hear it, and this was actually, I think this, this preset itself, I dropped it in, and it came out of one of the Loop Masters, I think it was off one of their Detroit plugins, and it was, I can be very wary of using, buying sample packs, but there's the ones I bought from them were actually really beneficial. Yeah. I've must got these last year, I think this was the first track I made with them. So uh, Motec, the label that it's coming out on, did you have that label in mind when you were making this? I've, um, I wanted to put something out for Motec. I gave Frankie, the label manager, DJ3000, I gave him, this is actually the B side, the A side, I gave to him and he was really up for using it. He's like, yeah, let's do this. I'll get it remixed and maybe you can do another side. And I'm like, yeah, of course. So this was done 110% geared for them. Okay, This cool. was done totally for them, I thought. I, I, this will fit the package perfectly, yeah. but it, it's, I didn't want it just to sound like any B-side, I wanted to try and put the effort in to make it sound like an A-side, yeah. just as worthy of having, having the A-side. Do you do that a lot? Like, aim yeah. tracks? Yeah. Really? Yeah. Oh, that's interesting. Like, um, but sometimes, I don't do it all the time, but I, ca I can think I want to do something for these guys. Yeah. And then, you know, like, as yes, you'll see with my back catalogue, it's not just house, it can be techno as well, like, it's, it's quite varied, so, and that's how I like to keep it. But yeah, I, I can still I retain it makes myself. Sense. Like if you want to be on a certain label, you know, obviously there's house and there's techno, but within that there are so many like niche oh, you know, yeah. subgenres and everything. And each yeah. label has a generally a really specific sound. So I guess you if you want to be on that label, you kind of have to yeah, like, tailor it yeah, to you, do that. Yeah, you can. And you can you can do it by still being who you are. You know, it's um, like I put stuff in rejected, I put stuff in planet E. You'll hear the difference right there. Yeah. You'll hear something very housey and you'll hear something Pure Detroit. Yeah. And it's just just the way it is. Um, but that's how a lot of people might frown with that attitude. But I embrace it. I, it's a reflection of me, and that's how I want to do it. Yeah, absolutely. Whatever works for you. Yeah. So these stabby chords. Yes. Um, what kind of processing have you got on those? On the chords, we are using. I've got them first going through a Q10. It's basically another um, EQ from Waves. I've taken off the bottom end, mm -hmm. which is about 500. Added a bit more brightness here with this one here. Sounds a lot more tin as you can hear. Yeah. Obviously, there's other uh, plugins that play here, but that just brings it out a lot more. Yeah, much better. But what I've done is I've I've used a meta flanger. I've got quite a lot of modulation going on here. This is only a small part of it. You've got a meta flanger here, and you can see obviously it's modulating. It's mm -hmm. not going at a crazy speed. But this is my favourite plugin. This is the H delay. 
you get some amazing... I love the H to yeah, it's great. It's my favourite. It's really, it's great. <laughs> it, it's fantastic, you know, yeah. like, I'm not surprised you said that because it, it is great. And it's, this, the room modulation sounds coming off this, you'll hear right now. Sounds boring now without it. <laughs> but then the metafunger is, it's modulating as well, but only slightly. Yeah. So it just adds a bit more to it. This is great. I usually use the F2. It's just basically a filter that I usually use on the master, but I have just added a bit more here. Oh, so we moved some more frequencies here. Mm -hmm. And then a compressor at the ends. Obviously, it's a nice, it's a nice pattern I've got going there. But you want to keep it interesting. Yeah. It's, it's quite a dubby record. It is. It's a lot of energy behind it. But I, I decided to change it up, and you can see here on the, um, on the where, where the, um, the, the patterns are changing colour. Mm -hmm. If you say you were DJing all night, mm -hmm. Fabric Room One, mm -hmm. at what time of the night do you think this track would slot into? You could play it. I reckon for about two. 2, 3 a.m. When, yeah. when there's a changeover between the warm-up artist, the warm-up DJ and the, the headliner. I think that's, I think that, yeah, you I know, think you're right, actually. yeah, I think that'd be a yeah. good time for it because it's, it's, it's got a lot going on, but it's one of those tracks that's quite accessible, it can slot in. Yeah. And this record itself, it's I can imagine. It's a bit of a transition track, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, yeah definitely, yeah, it's a good word. Yeah. Okay, cool. And so, it, like, in terms of arrangement, mm -hmm. do you kind of have, like, like an arrangement formula, I guess, that you use, like a club track formula, and you just kind of lay everything out, or is it like more of a live jam thing, or it's, how do you um, approach that? At the moment, I'm in the, in the past, I've tried to do a more general formula, be a bit more regimented, going beginning, middle, end, you know, yeah. like chorus. Break right. down. Yeah, exactly. Drop. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and now I'm just trying to do stuff more live. You know, I've, I've been working in the studios with some friends recently, and some of them don't even use MIDI. And I'm like, you don't use MIDI, you know, like, and, it, and it's given me a whole new lease of life of the way you can approach records. Yeah. And just think, like you were saying, there's no rules. Why don't you just try it this way? Yeah. It's, it's sort of scary thinking there's no MIDI, you can't go back and redo it, you know, yeah. once it's laid down. And I find that constrains you a lot more mm -hmm. and will make you more creative. That's yeah. why I like using a bit of outboard because I think I just don't use the box. It's just, it just cre gets those creative juices flowing. Yeah. Every, everyone's different, but it works for me. And it's, it's very easy to get stuck in the box of what you're used to doing as oh, well. Oh, definitely. You know, it's just, it, it, it can give you serious writer's block. But, yeah. you know, but there's obviously, there's a lot of potential with it too. What I've done here on this drop, I've, this is basically a reverse of that synth. Mm -hmm. I've just recorded it into that channel, the yeah. audio, and reversed it. And that's just laid on top of the regular. You can yeah. see, I think it should, yeah, it would make it seem like that. Simple, yeah, effective. Yeah, exactly. When I originally did this record, I was talking with Frankie from, from Motec and I had a pad or a string on it. I think it was a string. And he told me, he, he told me to take it off. I think his words were perhaps less is more, and that Mad Mike Banks from Underground Resistance had told him the same thing. Yeah. And I totally get where he was coming from. It was, it was just, I'd rather have, there's not even that many tracks here, there's probably about eight to ten tra channels here, and it, it was just quality over quantity. Yeah. That's what it was, just trying to strip it back. And, and it was, and he was the one that told me to do that, and he was right. It yeah. just, it, sometimes you, it was overproduced. The way I've tried to keep it interesting, like I said before, you've, you've got the original sequence here, mm -hmm. and it's redone. Throughout the record, you can see I've colour coded it because there's yeah. different MIDI hits, extra notes, less notes. And that just keeps it a bit more interesting, a bit more exciting. Yeah. And then um, here's some more elements coming out. The ride comes back in. If I'm using a snare roll on these two drops here, some with gaps, and then towards the drop, Continuous and that mm -hmm. effectively just adds intensity. Yeah. You know, the listener knows it's going to be a drop. It just feels. Everyone up. loves a good snare roll. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> and it's got like an old school feel yeah. to it as well, as you hear. Yeah, exactly. EQ taking a bit of the bottom end off of it. You'll hear 
actually, there's the last one you have to do. Mm -hmm. here, mess about a bit on the final drop. What can we, what can we expect from the remixes on this? They, they've used a lot of the original parts. Yeah. They've, I think. Do you, do you like it when an artist does that? Yeah, yeah. I do. They, the remixes um, haven't been done on this record, they've been done of the other side, but um, they, but going on to that, they have used a lot of the original parts. I don't think they should use them, they've used them and they've been done to great, they've done actually done a really good job of it. Yeah. But I don't, I'd understand if they don't want to use the whole sequence or if they want to just take the first note and yeah. put it into a sampler because they're still remixing it. I wouldn't get offended if they didn't use much of it, but I think there should still be enough of an element to know to that's where it's from. Yeah, yeah. But for at least the people behind the record to know. Yeah, exactly. Otherwise, it's, you might as well just sign it off as their own track, yeah. like, their own original. Yeah. And then you can see I've done little dropouts here. This just keeps it interesting. Simple, very effective. I've got the side chain still running, just because there's, um, actually there's no bass on that one there, but it's good to keep it running in case mm -hmm. there is a bass sound there, otherwise it, you'll pretend it pops out okay, yeah. and it will just sound terrible. Unless it's, that's the sound you want just for it to be a bit crazier, but on this it won't work. So you tend to, um, in some of your other productions, you've collaborated a lot with different people and vocalists as well. Yep. What's, what's the collaboration process like compared it's, to just um, writing music on your own? It's, um, it can be fun. It's, um, you, um, I find collaborating in the studio with someone is, is, is a bit similar to when you DJ back to back with someone. If it goes well, it goes amazingly well. Yeah. If it doesn't go so well, it's terrible. Yeah. It's just, it's the, it's the... Do you have to know the person if you're going to DJ back to back with them? You have to have a good idea of their music. Yeah. yeah you have to. Like, you have to know what they're like and that helps a lot. So you've automated those snare drums yeah. with... That is, that is the F2. Um, you can see it getting to work there. Oh yeah. And the way I've, I've automated that as well, it's, um, it's something you're DJing, if you're using the filter on the Pioneer 900 or yeah. the Allen Heath, on the drop you like to filter because when it smacks back in you've got maximum bass, it has more of an effect, people are enjoying it a lot more. I've, I've, I've just put something simple there onto the snare and it makes a lot of difference. Yeah. It just, that's where DJ and production can help each other out. And then we're like coming into the little outro mm -hmm. bit here. What is your mastering process? Do you put anything on the master bar? Master. Yeah. You know what, I, I don't. When I finish a record, this is obviously the final one. On the master bus, I tend not to actually put anything. I like to keep the levels low. Mm -hmm. I like to give, I give a lot of headroom to the mastering engineer because probably more than they need, but I'd rather do that. Like obviously when I'm, I, I use limiters and stuff when I'm doing a rough DJ master, mm -hmm. to say if, when I create this and I'm playing at the weekend, so we can play it, it's not, and it's not mixed, well, it's mixed down, but it's not had the mastering engineer's touch. And obviously yeah. I don't want to get involved in doing proper mastering because that's that that obviously I, I could look it up but it doesn't interest me right now but obviously you can't rush those things that's mm. the real art in itself that oh, could absolutely, that can yeah. totally mess up a record you've been doing this for quite some time now do you have any tips or advice for bedroom producers out there who who want to take their productions to the next level even i benefit from it now is it's probably something they're doing but just to keep doing a lot more of this looking at tutorials and videos just yes, to keep doing do that, that. <laughs> Rain Blank Music School. Yeah, nice little plug there. But uh, <laughs> no, I, jokes aside, sometimes we get caught in a trap where you want to be able to, or you think, want to be able to know everything already. You don't know everything already, and it, you're always learning. Mm. Like, I'm discovering things that I wish I'd have learned sooner, but we're lucky we've got that at our disposal before it'd just be have been lucky enough to hang out in, in a studio with someone. Yeah. I, was, I was lucky when I was younger, I used to hang out in a lot of studios and get first-hand experience of people doing things. Any other DJs that you that um, really inspired by? Uh, I like um, Adam Bayer, Dave Clark, like real so techno like heads techno. like that. Yeah, yeah, real techno heads like them. But, Room uh, 2 fabric. Yeah, 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 <laughs> proper like that. And um, But one thing I like about Lauren Garnier is, is um, I remember going to see him at the end, I was about 19, 20. I remember seeing him at the end when he used to do all night long. What I loved about him was his verse 
uh, the versatility. I remember seeing someone, I've never seen anyone as into the music as him when he's DJing wherever I've seen him play. Really? And he's like, everyone says how nice he is and when you meet him, it's just like everything everyone says, it's just like really yeah. super nice and he's still at the top of his game. Oh nice, cool. Well thank you so much for running us through that. Uh, thanks for having um, me. Have you got any gigs coming up? Yeah, we've got um, a couple of social festivals. Uh, we've got Maidstone next week, Mexico City in Bogota. Um, next weekend so yeah got some fun ones coming Ooh, up amazing well thank you so much for coming in well, thanks for having me yeah it's been really good chatting with you um thanks for joining us guys uh if you would like to find out more about mixing mastering djing or music production head to our website pointblankmusicschool.com where you can find out more we'll see you soon